Welcome to This Week in South Carolina. I'm Gavin Jackson. This week, we look at the labor shortage affecting the state, as well as how inflation and supply chain issues are impacting the economy. Here in Greenville, the South Carolina Chamber of Commerce hosted a workforce symposium, and we caught up with keynote speaker Tom Barkin, president and CEO of the Federal Reserve Bank of Richmond. President Barkin, thanks for joining me. No, it's great to be with you, Gavin. So tell me right now, when we look at the biggest issues facing South Carolina and the region, uh, can you pick one? There's supply chain issues, there's labor shortages, and there's also just you know, inflation is a permanent threat right now, it seems like. Which one do you think is the biggest issue right now facing the region? Well, I'm very focused on the labor side because I think it underlies everything. Mm. Um, when you say there are supply chain shortages, it's not as simple as people don't have materials. Often they don't have enough workers. Mm -hmm. And when you talk to people about why don't you add some capacity, to alleviate these shortages, people will say, I can't find any workers to build the capacity. So I think labor is behind a good bit of the supply chain side. I also think to the extent we've had price pressures this year, some of it is labor. And if you look at people paying more money, let's say in fast food places, uh, and therefore forced to increase their prices because they've increased their costs, that's labor too. And so where I'm focused is on the labor side. And what makes it interesting, important, is we have five million fewer workers employed today in this country than we did 18 months ago. And so it's possible. There's been a significant structural change. People have reassessed their lives, retired, decided to stay home from work. But it's also possible that we don't yet have the circumstances in place to get them into the workforce. And the difference between having and not having those 5 million workers is a pretty big deal. And when we look at getting back to bringing those 5 million people back into the workforce, how do you do that? What, what are your messages? What do you think needs to be done to re-engage them in a sense? Well, there's a lot of work being done on this topic, but there are a few things I think that are pretty straightforward. One is we got to put this virus behind us. Um, retirements spiked last year. Um, you can imagine that people in their 60s might have said, I'm not sure I'm going to put myself at risk working in a workforce. So giving them the confidence they can go back to the workforce and be healthy, that's important. Uh, getting schools open and safe and stable. Um, I hear a lot from parents uh, in South Carolina mm -hmm. who, because the schools opened up earlier here than in most of the rest of my district, talking about quarantines and kids getting sent home sick. And it's hard to commit to work if you don't know how you're going to handle your, your child rearing. So that's another uh, piece of it. Child care, that industry is an industry that was troubled before the pandemic. Um, it's one of those classic industries where the wages are low and the prices are too high. And the profits are too low for people to build. And so it's just an industry that's not all that functional right now. And you will need childcare at scale to be able to support even more people uh, in the workplace. All that's relevant. I think the question of how all uh, the various incentives that hit individuals hit, and there's been a lot of talk about the enhanced unemployment, but I would point to the stimulus checks as well, also the child tax credit, and maybe even more fundamentally, the amount of money that people have saved, mm -hmm. whether it is by these various packages or just because they've spent a lot less, which gives them the financial flexibility to be choosy. And, and when you're choosy, you often look for higher wages. And so all of that is going on uh, in the workforce right now. And I, I really think getting this virus behind us and getting to the other side, that, that is a really fundamental uh, piece of the puzzle. What another part too, when you're talking about people being choosy, I think about 4 million people quit in August, it sounded like, and about a fourth of them, a fourth of them actually quit without even having other jobs lined up. What does that indicate to you that people are just looking for something better, that they have abilities to, to kind of demand higher wages or look for a better, better job? Well, I've been talking to a lot of headhunters and others about this topic, um, and I think there are four or five things going on uh, together. Uh, one is, people generally don't quit during a uh, downturn, mm -hmm. right? If you've got a job, you want to keep the job, and now that we're sort of on the other side of it maybe people have a little more confidence to quit. In addition, right, um, if people around you have been quitting and coming back with stories of how good their job is or how much more money they got paid, maybe you think it's time to do that. There's a looming set of mismatches that exist in the workforce. Um, I wanna work remote, but my employer wants me to come back, or I wanna work in person and my employer wants to go remote. Or maybe I moved with my boyfriend or girlfriend to some other city and haven't told my employer yet. Uh, vaccine mandates could be relevant to it. You know, I don't want to go to a place where everyone isn't vaccinated or I don't want to go back if I have to get uh, vaccinated. And in a lot of professional settings, I'm hearing stories of people who have been living in workplaces where they're short employees 
and they've just been working harder and harder and harder. And so there's Being this. Paid more? Well, no, there's a doom loop where people leave, you work harder, then you leave. And I think a lot of companies are kind of struggling with that right now. And so all of these are leading to elevated, uh, elevated quits. And, um, you know, again, I want to see if we can't get some more folks back in the workforce to loosen the stress here. So do you think employers have maybe reevaluated what it means to employ people? Do you think that they've kind of, you know, Maybe we need to take some internal looks and say, do we hire enough people? Are we retaining enough people? Are we doing enough to make it attractive for people to stay here, whether that be adding childcare or flexible work hours? I mean, are these employees running the table these days? Employers are very much into this conversation right now. And of course, near term, you only have a few limited choices. You can hire someone to help you search more. So I hear people investing in recruiters, mm -hmm. for example, and you can raise pay and benefits. And you hear a lot of stories on that. Um, longer term, I'm hearing employers ask themselves the question of, have we moved from a regime where we were uh, long labor to one where we're short labor? Um, because a lot of employers, if you go back 20 years, made a bunch of choices that implicitly had an assumption that they had a lot of labor. They went to temps and part-times or outside agencies, or they offshored, or they did away with training programs. And I'm hearing employers now say, well, what do I need to do now to change this? And some of it will be good for the workforce. Things like uh, bringing training back in-house, things like broadening the set of profiles that you hire, including you know, people with drug records or, or prison records even. You know, some of that will be good uh, for the workforce, uh, but some of it will be a challenge for the workforce. I talked to a fast food chain that's very much uh, thinking about, well, we have 11 people per store now. How would we operate with five? Whatever combination of less service, uh, don't open the store, just use the drive through robots that cook your french fries. All of those things are being uh, looked at because the one thing you know for sure is you won't be in this kind of disequilibrium forever. Yeah. You'll raise wages enough that people come in the workforce, you'll raise wages enough that employers start doing other things to lower the number of workers. Somewhere in there we're gonna, we'll settle. But do you think that we'll have some lasting impacts from this when we look at automation, when you're talking about downsizing, becoming more efficient, do you think some of those changes will, will stick around after all this balances back out? Well, any automation investment is a lasting impact. And if you go into a factory now, you'll see a lot of machines, a few people fixing the machines, and not as many people as you think in a manufacturing facility. And that's part of the legacy of all the automation that was done in manufacturing over the last 20 years. So if you go to a fast food place and it's been automated enough so that a robot, let's say, is cooking your french fries, you're never gonna replace that robot with a human. Again, so people will then debate, is that good because productivity is good and those jobs weren't that attractive with a career path anyway? But I do worry about, uh, I'll call it the last people into the workforce. And if the jump for the last people into the workforce is too great, if the first job you have in the workforce is repairing that robot, that's a pretty hard job for your first job. And so, you know, I am worried about whether we're going to have, as all this plays out, enough jobs available for people who want to work to step into the workforce, get their training and, and move on. Another place you could think about this is 16 year olds. I mean, you may be like me. I started working when I was uh, 16 in a, mm -hmm. um, in a uh, uh, fast food place. And, you know, that was a good place to learn how one works. It wasn't necessarily my career path. I chose central banking instead, but, the, uh, but it, it was a start. And to the extent that wages are up, they'll hire fewer people. They'll fewer people will start there. It's just how the math works. Still demand for those jobs too. But I want to really wrap up this portion by talking about women in the workforce because we have seen such a decrease of them. And I want to get your thoughts on just how you get that segment back engaged in the workforce, whether it be providing benefits or um, you know, what you need to do to get them back in there because it seems like it's a drag on the economy, but it's also an unknown right now because of COVID and homeschooling and remote work. So what's interesting is that um, women's participation in the workforce has dropped four points since about 2000 when it hit its peak. Uh, in Canada, in contrast, it's increased five points. And the difference is not uh, college-educated women. Actually, college-educated women have kept their, their participation. Even during this pandemic, they've actually recovered slightly better than college-educated men. The real issue is working class and less educated women in the U.S. And it's not that hard, I think, when you think hard about that person, what the challenge is. It's the math, right? It's the math of what's the benefit of work versus the cost 
of work. And you know, the benefit includes pay and benefits, and often these working class women aren't being paid all that much, and many of these jobs don't have health care benefits. Mm -hmm. And the cost is whatever trade-off you're making in terms of uh, a second income or even a first income versus health care if you're on disability, um, or, or money you can make in the shadow economy, child care or whatever. And so I, I think this does come down to, to math in the end. Now, all that is assuming we get COVID beyond us, we get schools opened and you know, uh, stable. It's not just open, but not sending kids home. And, and you get child care operating. So child care would be a part of that too. But you know, I just think the math of it is very interesting. And when you start digging into what it costs to have a quality child care, together with transportation, uniforms, yeah. um, taxes, foregone benefits, the math isn't all that compelling. We're talking more about costs going up as well. We're talking about inflation. South Carolinians are paying more to eat dinner, more to drive their cars to work, and then paying more in rent. It's, it's also going up as well. When do you foresee this inflation start to taper, or are we going to be stuck with it for longer than we expected, or how long do we, how long do we have to deal with this for? <laughs> Well, I mean, I think we all know that the price inflation we're seeing right now is being driven disproportionately by um, the challenges our economy has had coming back to work after the pandemic. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of it has been in new cars and used cars and car rentals. Mm -hmm. That's because for some reason we can't get chips. Um, uh, a lot of it has been returned to normal in places like airlines and hotels and entertainment. That's because it dropped so much a year ago uh, and now it's back up. Rents dropped a bunch a year ago and now they're coming back up. So those are factors that are very real, they're very tangible, and they're very tied to this re incredibly complicated reopening of our economy. So it's not just one person we can blame for this? Like no, I, to do. I'm not sure who the person would be, but <laughs> so, I, so I, I think the challenge, of course, is looking in the future. Nobody has a crystal ball on this. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as I'm talking to, to businesses and I'm talking to consumers, I'm trying to ask the question, of what do you expect price increases to be like a year ago, a year from now? Mm -hmm. and, and a simple way to ask the question is, do you expect it to be more like the last six months or more like the last 25 years? Because we've had about one and a half, two percent inflation for the last 25 years. Mm -hmm. We've had about, depending on the metric you use, three and a half or four percent inflation for the last six months. You know, which, which do you yeah. think is right? And most folks I talk to still believe that um, this is being caused by disproportionate cost pressures or supply pressures, which are leading to disproportionate prices. And then when we get to the other side of it, it'll settle. But are people getting a little too antsy, you think? I mean, are people kind of calling on the Fed to start increasing rates ahead of when they should be increasing rates? Or do you think we need to wait to see how supply chain issue concerns settle down? We see how labor markets continue to maybe expand a little bit more so there's not these, uh, you know, these long-term issues because of wage growth. Well, there are a lot of people who have a good idea about what the Fed should or shouldn't do. Um, for me, you know, I have two very real questions in my mind that I still think we have a little time to answer. One is this question of, do we come back to the last six months, the last 25 years? Mm -hmm. Very interested in that. We'll know more, you know, over the next couple quarters or so. Uh, the second one is, do these five million people come back in the workforce? It's, it's connected to the, the first question. Um, and two months ago, I would have thought we'd have a lot more of them in the workforce because I thought COVID would be behind us. I thought schools would be cleanly open. You know, I thought unemployment insurance expiring would bring more people in. Mm -hmm. That hasn't happened yet at the pace that I'd expected. I'm still looking for that to happen. But if, you know, we're a couple quarters down the road and that hasn't happened, that would be a signal to me too. Tom, with about two minutes left, I want to ask you just about supply chain issues that we've been talking about. Um, do you think there might be some long-term changes because of this, because of what we've seen over the past 18 months, that we might see some onshoring of jobs? coming back to the country, whether it be medical supply chains, other critical supply chains, as well as just the fact that we could have business here and not have to worry about the Port of Los Angeles or the Port of Charleston yeah. as much? Well, for sure you're gonna see supply chain changes. Um, the things that I think are uh, inescapable are dependence on any one country, whether it be China or any other country. People, I think, are stepping back from that, I think, pretty quickly. Uh, the second is uh, low inventories as a strategy. I, I hear lots of stories of people who are restocking inventories with plans to get them to safety stock levels. You'll note in the auto industry, Toyota was the least affected by this chip shortage, in part because of the nuclear uh, incident in 2011, mm -hmm. meant that they'd already been through it once. So they were stocking a lot more chips than I'm told the other manufacturers. Um, 
It may well happen, healthcare you mentioned, that some companies will bring their manufacturing onshore. When I talk to folks about it, there are two big barriers still. One is, is the industry doing it or is it just me? Because they're all still competitive. And if the industry is in China or Mexico and you're manufacturing here, presumably your costs are higher. Mm -hmm. And so people are looking for, like in the defense industry, maybe the government will mandate certain things produced onshore, that would do it. But the second issue gets back to labor. I mean, it's pretty hard to imagine opening a plant here if we can't staff the plants we have. And so I do think workforce is important for that, too. And I think American companies would actually like conceptually to bring the work back. But as I said on the uh, women's participation, the math has to work. One last question, sir. Just looking at what we can be expecting for the next six months or so, what are you watching for? What should folks at home be watching for when it comes to determining where we're going in this economy? Well, um, as I said, I'm looking hard at what happens to prices and what happens to employment. That's our mandate. Um, I think there are a couple externalities, if I could call them that, that are relevant. Um, I certainly hope we won't have a debt ceiling problem. That's December 3rd, but you know, it would not be good news if we did. That has a lot of implications for the full faith and credit of the U.S. government. Um, is there additional stimulus passed? And whether that additional stimulus is funded or not mm. is important, and whether in the end those initiatives create more workers, which they might, or actually limit the workforce, which it might. And the devil is very much in the details of those programs, so I'm watching closely to see you know, what they do, and importantly, what they do to workforce participation, which I think is just uh, fundamental. And then you've always got to watch for a geopolitical event. So. <laughs> Plenty of those. Thank you very much. We'll have to leave it there, President Tom Barkin. He's the President and CEO of the Federal Reserve Bank of Richmond. Thank you so much. Great to be with you. Thanks, Gavin. We also spoke with President and CEO of the State Chamber of Commerce, Bob Morgan. I opened up by asking him what the biggest issue is affecting the state's economy. Well, I would agree with him that it's the resurgence of COVID. We are not beyond it. I uh, thought a couple of months ago that uh, we were in a post-pandemic economy. We're not yet. And so I think, yes, we had a workforce challenge prior to the pandemic, the coming talent wars that we've all heard about, um, that is a global dynamic, uh, been exacerbated by the pandemic, and, uh, and we're still dealing with the immediate aftermath of so many people dropping out of the workforce uh, for the reasons that he talked about. So what do you think is some, what are, what are some of the big issues you're hearing from uh, businesses out there in terms of getting people in the door? Is it because they're not paying enough, people are asking for too much money, or they're not qualified enough, or what's, what are the big issues that they're trying to to tackle right now in South Carolina? Uh, what I'm hearing more than anything is lack of skills. Um, talked to an automotive manufacturer yesterday. Uh, can get plenty of resumes uh, in, can start folks in the training programs, uh, but then they drop out. They're not able to keep them. Uh, and so um, developing the skills for the jobs of the advanced manufacturing economy that we have uh, appears to be the biggest challenge. Mm -hmm. But there's always been a lot of partnership too with the technical colleges in the state. Um, how are those going? Are you seeing more programs coming online? Are you seeing more apprenticeships coming online to kind of fill these needs, this workforce development issue that's always kind of been present, like you're saying, even before the pandemic? Are we meeting that demand? Well, I think there's been some good progress there. We saw the Department of Employment and Workforce working with the technical college system this summer uh, to basically offer free uh, education in certain disciplines that are most needed, those skilled jobs, uh, someone could continue to draw unemployment uh, while they got that free certification. And uh, the demand for that has been very strong. So that's encouraging. Um, it's got to be scaled up to have the, the impact that, that we wanted to have. Mm -hmm. And where are we seeing the most in-demand sectors in the state? Do you know off the top of your head in terms of, is it manufacturing? Is it uh, service industry, is it kind of all of the above? Where the challenge is the greatest? Mm -hmm. Manufacturing and hospitality and tourism, for certain. And that's just a matter of kind of getting those different jobs and, um, and people involved in those careers. But how do we do that? I mean, is, are we getting into the people? Are we trying to maybe move people up from, say, a hospitality service industry to try and get interested in doing something like manufacturing or truck driving even? Well, it's, again, offering those certifications, which are very specific skill sets that hopefully will produce value well beyond uh, the pandemic. And uh, education, 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 right? And um, now for the hospitality and tourism industry, 
Um, you know, they are losing people to other industries, yeah. which is a unique challenge. Uh, manufacturing, that's not so much the case. Manufacturers lose people to other manufacturers, but uh, there's a whole lot of people who've been in tourism and hospitality who are moving uh, out to, to other industries. So, so that's a unique challenge for them. I'd also like to add to all of this, uh, it is a national and even global issue. And just caution us a little bit, um, Walmart has just announced uh, a new sophisticated high-tech distribution center uh, in Spartanburg County. I think they're gonna put 450 people to work. Walmart looks at South Carolina and sees the issue a little bit differently, right? Yeah. They see the sixth fastest growing uh, state uh, in the country. They see a state that's attractive as the macro trend of people moving from the Northeast and the Midwest to the Sun Belt. Uh, South Carolina gets its fair share. Um, maybe we'd like to get a little bit more than our fair share, not to minimize the challenge to existing employers, but isn't it interesting that an employer like Walmart, which knows the state very well, they're, they do business throughout the state, mm -hmm. but they see opportunity here. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so I guess maybe what you're saying is that you're not too worried about perspective uh, employers coming to the state, perspective companies coming to the state, because even though there are some labor issues that everyone's dealing with, we're still, I guess, competitive when it comes to attracting new businesses. Which seems a bit counterintuitive, mm -hmm. right? Because we see the, the pressure on wages and benefits, um, mm -hmm. and yet here's a major employer uh, that knows us well and that sees, sees opportunity. And so, Bob, when you're talking to businesses about just, you know, maybe extending benefits or trying to retain talent or recruit talent, uh, I think we saw hourly earnings in the state increased about $27 from about $25 an hour in 2020. So we're seeing rising wages. Are we seeing more benefits? Are we seeing employers try to do more to keep these employees and attract more employees? Without a doubt. But let's also talk a minute about the vaccine um, and the proposed, uh, the federally uh, proposed uh, mandate. Um, a lot of employers are trying to figure that out. Um, is it a mandate that's needed? or are incentives needed? Um, I'm aware of one company bought three pickup trucks and raffled them off to employees who uh, had been vaccinated. We, we see others who are raising the cost of health insurance for those who are not vaccinated. We've seen examples of companies not gonna wait for the federal government, gonna go ahead and, and mandate themselves. And so, um, like, Boeing. like Boeing, like Nephron, and so I, I think, you know, there's the long-term question of wages and benefits yeah. and whatnot, uh, but in the short term, it really uh, centers around uh, the vaccine and what do we do about that. And we're, we're just talking about those companies with over 100 employees to either get the mandated vaccine or get tested a week, every week. Um, but so what, what, are the, what are the feelings? I know you're talking about different ways to incentivize or to deal with this, but are businesses happy about this or how are they responding when you're asking them about how this is working? Maybe not. They're maybe they're not happy about this. Well, our polling has showed that a majority of companies are opposed to the federal mandate, mm -hmm. but the opposition is rather muted. Mm -hmm. There are many companies who are legitimately worried about the impact on workforce. If I'm down 10% already, and if I now am mandated to require a vaccine, what if I lose another 10%? That's going to dig my hole deeper. Mm -hmm. And yet, there are many who would also say okay, we don't feel like we can do this ourselves, but we'd like for the federal government to go ahead and do it. And so there's some muted support um, that I think comes from, first and foremost, companies do not want to see a shutdown mm -hmm. again. Uh, that was a painful experience. It was more minimal in South Carolina than many other states. It was still painful here. I think if you ask people the choice between a potential shutdown versus a federal mandate for vaccines, I think they'd be willing to go along with the federal mandate for vaccines if it means we can keep the economy open. Especially even with Governor McMaster saying he'll never shut it back down if he doesn't have to. Correct. Uh, Bob, with about maybe a minute 30 left, I want to ask you just, do you think that businesses have come to deal with handling COVID-19 at this point? I know you kind of said earlier that people, it's still very big unknown, but do you think that they're, they've adapted to it well at this point where we can have business as normal? I don't know that there's an MBA school that prior to this offered a course on how to deal with the pandemic. <laughs> yeah. And yet- There probably will be after that. <laughs> well, um, if there's not, there should be. Yeah, there's money right and there. we've all lived through it and we've all tried different approaches and 
We've all studied different approaches and we've survived to, to be here today. And so I do think there's a base of knowledge. We're all smarter about the subject. And, uh, and I think that's gonna help us avoid the complete shutdown. The numbers are certainly working in our favor as it regards the Delta variant right now. Uh, that's encouraging. The health experts tell me it could be six weeks, six months that we could see another variant. Um, and so we can't let our guard down. But I do think we know how to be more vigilant. I do think with every day more Americans are being vaccinated. Uh, and at the end of the day, that's what's gonna get us beyond this pandemic. Mm -hmm. And then Bob, just really quick, 30 seconds. What's your economic outlook looking like for the state for the next six months or so? Well, I think the next six months may be a little choppy, but I think longer term, South Carolina is on the cusp of, as the governor uh, said recently, um, we're ready to blast off. Mm -hmm. uh, and But for uh, things caused by the pandemic, the, the, the labor shortage, which leads to the inflation, which leads to the supply chain mm -hmm. uh, issues that are all tied together, uh, we have a remarkably <coughs> diverse economy. Mm -hmm. People want our products and services, and uh, I think the future is very bright for South Carolina. We'll leave it there. Bob Morgan, President and CEO of the South Carolina Chamber of Commerce, thank you so much. Thank you. For SETV, I'm Gavin Jackson, Greenville. Be well, South Carolina.